We were asked a question at the end of the last uh, session around incentives for data quality. And it, that was a really great question. And in fact, several others told me they thought it was a great and a hard question, but it really resonated with me because I find it mystifying that there has not been a sufficient incentive in this $3 trillion industry that we call medicine to not create consumer reports for medicine. Why don't we, I mean, these are things that are not only extremely expensive and come from different sources, but they also do uh, affect our, our life directly, our quality of life and our, the length of our life. And so how do we even think, begin to think about doing that? And I had a certain order of battle here, but I decided that I'm gonna change the order a little bit. And I'm gonna ask a eminent cancer researcher, Dr. Gary Lyman, who's the co-director of the Hutchinson Institute for Cancer Outcomes Research, and who's published many, many much more important papers than the paper he's gonna highlight, but the paper that I hope he's gonna highlight is the one that really got my attention, and I hope he will uh, make it clear to you why I asked him to be this, on this panel around uh, consumer reports for precision medicine. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zach, and a good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here despite the, uh, the long commute. Uh, last night, uh, it's always nice to come back. I spent some time here as a postdoc in biostats at the School of Public Health and at the Farber and uh, to connect with some colleagues. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I, uh, I'm going to try to address this issue, and I will highlight this recent very small uh, initial series of an ongoing study that I think pertains to some of the questions that have come up. I'll highlight uh, another uh, collaboration uh, related to multi-stakeholder engagement in the process of defining the role of genomics and biomarkers more generally in, in uh, molecularly targeted therapies coming out of the Institute of Medicine uh, this past year. Uh, it was uh, a two-year effort uh, chaired by Hale Harold Moses at uh, Vanderbilt, many of you may know. Uh, it came up with a whole bunch of recommendations. I won't go through all of them. Uh, in fact, I will try to advance the slides here. Uh, 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 well. If I can go back to Please bring it up. No. Uh, it should be Lyman presentation. Uh, up, up, uh, down one. Up, down one. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Thank you. Um, great, thank you. Uh, so what we, uh, this collaboration was ad addressing a previous report that many of you are aware of, uh, highlighting some of the, uh, some controversies and in fact uh, uh, some really difficult issues came out of early genomics work at Duke University and elsewhere uh, around uh, uh, the, uh, the, the validation and, and uh, uh, the truthfulness of the data coming out and the need for us kind of all to get on the same page in terms of uh, understanding uh, the credibility, uh, validity of genomic data and its role, uh, not only in oncology, but across the space. Uh, obviously, there are many roadblocks that we address in that uh, Institute of Medicine report. It's about a 300-page document. It's a free download on the web if you want to look at it. But I just highlight... Uh, uh, the component at the bottom, which is, is this challenge of full integration of uh, genomics and, and molecular biomarkers into clinical practice. They're obviously very complex. We've talked about that a great deal today. Their interpretation is complex. 
Most of us as clinicians we had no training in this area. Uh, I would dare say those being trained and graduating this year, uh, five years from now, will still be uh, challenged to, uh, uh, to guide patients uh, through this. The role of molecular tumor boards has been mentioned and, and is very much highlighted in this report because we need uh, uh, experts around the table, uh, uh, again, stakeholders from both the clinical, uh, the genomics world, and the patient world uh, to, uh, to opine and, and help guide decisions, clinical decisions on these. The data integration issue was highlighted as well. The clinical genomic data, patient reported outcomes uh, uh, needed to be uh, uh, brought together uh, under a common platform uh, for clinical decision support as well as research. The availability of targeted therapies, uh, of course those on label are available, the, but the off label ones often uh, with uh, uh, limited or no reimbursement. And, and identifying pa uh, patients who are candidates for clinical trials and showing them the direction, uh, 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 the opportunities they might have there. Uh, the use of guidelines, clinical practice guidelines, uh, which are often used to guide clinical decision making. Uh, there's been very little integration of the modern genomic era into uh, these clinical guidelines, and that is another uh, encouragement coming out of the Institute of Medicine. Uh, part of my day job is dealing with issues of cancer care delivery, uh, quality of care, and the cost and reimbursement of care, and no place is this more relevant uh, than in the area of uh, molecular diagnostics and, and targeted therapies, uh, which often have left patients uh, with enormous financial uh, burden or what we're calling financial toxicity these days, uh, increasing uh, uh, responsibilities for deductibles and out-of-pocket costs. And then the whole issue of access uh, to these, uh, we want to make sure that there is, uh, we eliminate as much disparities and opportunities. Uh, patients are educated as well as providers uh, across that. So that was the thrust of this, uh, uh, th this report. If you don't want to read the 300-page document, Hal Moses and I summarized it in two pieces uh, uh, this past year in the uh, New England Journal and the Journal of Clinical Oncology. The major points coming out of this uh, that I would just highlight are uh, that we uh, reemphasize the concern over the emergence of large-scale genomic data uh, that may be exceeding the capacity of oncologists or clinicians in general, uh, as, as well as our uh, IT colleagues to appropriately analyze and interpret the results for the individual patient. At the same time, we felt it was extremely important that we empower patients to participate in all aspects of the personalized medicine uh, uh, revolution and uh, that it was important uh, uh, for ultimately providing the highest quality of cancer care for individual uh, patients. And I'll just mention uh, two uh, specific recommendations related to that. Uh, one was is the development of patient and provider friendly standards in labeling around uh, in, in vitro diagnostics and laboratory developed uh, tests, uh, uh, biomarkers to facilitate transparency of test performance so we know the patient and provider know what the test can do and the level of evidence for its intended use. So uh, we felt that uh, it was extremely important. This is mainly a message to the FDA but uh, to others as well uh, about transparency and, and a standardized patient and provider friendly uh, labeling. And the second, uh, uh, to support studies to identify and overcome economic, cultural, ethnic, and uh, geographic barriers uh, to access to these tests, uh, to, provide, to increase uh, access equity, and public understanding of what they can do and where their limitations are. So the, uh, just the, the second collaboration is one uh, that uh, as Zach mentioned, uh, is a collaboration between our center and the commu a large community practices in the Seattle region. And this is just the first snapshot of an ongoing study of women uh, with a very difficult to treat cancer. Uh, this is metastatic triple negative breast cancer for which hormone therapies or anti uh, HER2 therapies are not effective. Um, chemotherapies can be tried, but they have very limited response in many of these patients. And what has been amazing has been the embracing of this study 
uh, by patients. Uh, not only, perhaps primarily because they're hoping for some answers that will help them in their disease course, but as you'll see in a minute, uh, for many other reasons, and much of them very altruistic. Uh, this is a study that will eventually be uh, between two and 300 patients. This is just the first, uh, first several patients on this, but we thought it was very important early on in the study to both look at a couple of issues. One is uh, what we're doing with this, uh, these patients with multiple metastatic lesions are having multiple biopsies done at baseline and serially over time. So the ultimate goal here is to look at this issue of both spatial and temporal heterogeneity of cancer. We know it changes, and therefore the therapeutic options and opportunities may change. So this is the, that's the ultimate goal here. But first and foremost, since we're using multiple platforms, uh, doing deep sequencing, a panomic uh, approach, a panomic approach to the uh, to the the tumor tissue that's removed. Uh, to look at two different commercial platforms uh, with very different approaches to assessing uh, tumor sequencing. One is, of course, across the Charles River Foundation Medicine. Uh, these are both very popular commercial platforms. Uh, uh, the other is uh, the Gardent uh, liquid biopsy, uh, uh, cell-free uh, ctDNA uh, assessment. Uh, because they're both being used in practice for very similar reasons to identify uh, mutations that might be targetable uh, for in these patients without good treatment uh, options. And so the first thing we wanted to do is see very early on, are we seeing uh, consistency or concordance between these uh, platforms? Um, and, and then to, um, to look at if we're seeing non-concordance or, or a limited concordance, uh, what might be accounting for that. Uh, and, and in actual fact, what, what we found uh, is that uh, only about 20% of the patients was the same mutation identified by both platforms. And while all but two patients had a targetable mutation identified, in most cases they were different mutations that were identified by the two different platforms. Uh, the, uh, and in some patients, there was no concordance in the mutations. In other words, the mutations in one platform were entirely different uh, than those in the other platform. At the same time, we looked at the drugs that were recommended or, or suggested by the two platforms, which is part of the report that comes out of those. And uh, in, uh, in most instances, not all, but in most instances, uh, there were different therapeutic recommendations that came out of the two platforms. So what might be the reason for them? First of all, these are very different technologies. One's tissue-based, one's blood-based. Uh, the tissue-based one doesn't include, uh, uh, as a part of it, the germline uh, mutations, and we know those are increasingly being recognized as uh, uh, perhaps uh, inf informational for uh, uh, therapeutic options in women with metastatic breast cancer. Uh, in the case of uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the CTDNA, uh, the Garden uh, 360 uh, platform, uh, uh, we know that there's uh, reporting of mutations with very low uh, variant uh, allele frequencies. And in fact, as you see here, when we looked at uh, the differences between these platforms, uh, we see that, in fact, the major differences or the major discordance between these platforms was the reporting of very, uh, 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 mutations with very low variant uh, allele frequency that is occurring in very small proportion of the cells, less than 1%. If you remove those, if you just look at those mutations with higher fr uh, VAFs, uh, there's much more, it's about a 60% concordance in the mutations identified across those. So these are the kinds of issues that, that, that really, uh, I think, are challenging us going forward, is to understand the platforms, what they can do, what their differences are, what their potential weaknesses are, and not, and not blind the patient or the, the physician to these potential challenges, and the, again, the need for uh, issues like uh, molecular tumor boards to, uh, uh, that are up-to-date, informed, uh, well-annotated data uh, uh, 
uh, linked or uh, clinical genomic data uh, information platforms to guide uh, the recommendations that are made. Uh, uh, and I'll just uh, 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 close by mentioning a, a, a study that will be coming out in the Journal of Clinical Oncology, Precision Oncology, in the next month, where we took the first 15 patients on this study and said, what do you think about your experience going through this? Multiple biopsies repeatedly over time. And again, patients with limited therapeutic options and a, a, a very uh, bad disease. Uh, but on the other hand, um, you know, uh, what, and if, admittedly a, 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 a somewhat biased sample perhaps because they volunteer for the study. But the conclusions of this uh, survey result done over time to date in the study suggest that all the participants uh, continue to express a strong desire to benefit others as a part of contributing or participating in the study. They all perceive perhaps a somewhat higher likelihood of benefiting from the results uh, than were, they were told would be the case during the informed consent process. Uh, they were, the, the lowest concern they had was about patient confidentiality or the confidentiality of their data. Uh, uh, the participants wanted access to findings and evaluating treatment choices even if that evidence was weak. And, uh, that, uh, they, and we found that there was very little change in the attitudes of the patients at baseline before starting the biopsy process and uh, uh, deep into their, uh, uh, their sequencing uh, studies. Uh, so participation helped patients cope better, uh, it's, it appears, uh, with their disease, uh, with their family, and with their social situation. So this study, I can't go into more detail because it's embargoed, but this study will be coming out. So our conclusions from all, all these engagements across stakeholders are this is part of mainstream oncology, it's part of mainstream medicine. Uh, we need to uh, more ac greater access to targeted therapies uh, as well as molecularly driven trials. Uh, but the complexity of genomic testing requires sophisticated data, data integration uh, and annotation, clinical decision support, molecular tumor boards, and any other support that we can provide. The barriers in terms of socioeconomic uh, uh, coverage uh, and reimbursement uh, as we addressed with the IOM panel, uh, encouraging uh, payers to consider coverage with evidence development during the period you, when you first uh, make the discovery of a promising uh, uh, marker and when it's demonstrated to be definitively uh, a, an improvement in care. That period of time, there needs to be some shared risk taking and, into, and payers need to consider uh, uh, sharing in the coverage of this so it doesn't fall on the patient, it doesn't fall solely on the institutions, uh, but we all have a stake in seeing progress and discovery move forward in this area. Thanks. Our uh, next presenter uh, is uh, herself a, a storied worker in the area of cancer genomics. But she introduced herself to me and she says, I'm a gas. And I said, what do you mean by that? She said, I'm compressible. And she wanted to know how much time she, she has to uh, speak. And so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from uh, Karen, uh, from Jill Hagencourt about uh, a leading company doing uh, cancer genomics in the commercial sense in many, many venues. Thank you. Thanks, and thanks for the invitation uh, to speak out here at this conference. Um, when we did the, the, the prep meeting um, on the phone, Zach asked if we would, you know, kind of share a little bit about our, our journeys, about kind of how we got to this place in our career. Um, there's, uh, I guess, a lot of trainees uh, in, in the audience, so, or entrepreneurs, so, uh, you know, as you tell the story, um, you know, looking back, it looks like I made a whole bunch of like really smart decisions along the way. It's all complete luck for the most part. But um, I've, I've ended up with a, a really amazing career and really fun career. Um, I am a board certified pathologist with subspecialty boards in molecular genetic pathology. And I did another fellowship in what at the time was called pathology oncology informatics at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, and essentially the, the molecular genetic pathology, it, that specialty, um, subspecialty, we focus on the nucleic acid testing uh, for inherited disease, um, 
testing of the tumor, so molecular oncology and molecular infectious disease as well as HLA and some other stuff. But that's mostly what we get our expertise in is the development of those assays and the interpretation of those results and working with um, the clinicians to um, apply them appropriately. Um, and at the time, I mean, it was a very, there was very few fellowships, it was very new. Informatics didn't even have a legitimate fellowship. Um, and, uh, but what it essentially was, was a, a fellowship in precision medicine, but we didn't have that term yet at the time. Um, and so it was just kind of luck. And when I told my chairman um, of my pathology department that I was gonna go do those fellowships, he looked at me and said, Jill, why don't you do a real fellowship? You're never gonna get a job. Um, so yeah, when the old white guy tells you that you're not doing the right thing, you know you're probably on to something hot, so don't be discouraged. So after um, I finished my fellowships, um, during my fellowships I, I kind of got to playing with a technology in my research time that I actually got to work. Um, and it was, it was cytogenomics, it was cancer cytogenomics at the time, we didn't have a name for it. Um, but it was using SNP arrays to kind of break up cancers and then, you know, rebuild the cancer genome in silico and then you could zoom around using like a genome browser, um, which was like using a, a Google or something like that to kind of go look through these cancer genomes um, in a way we really never had been able to do before. And it was breathtaking and fascinating and inspiring. So I um, contacted some colleagues out in Silicon Valley and I said, can we make a company out of this? And uh, they said yes. And now, again, that sounds great, but I want you to know that I probably pitched 30 other ideas to them over the years as I was finishing my residency and fellowship training, and they were like, yeah, no, that's not going to No, that's not going to be a company. But this one, they actually, they, I just didn't give up, and I was kind of shocked when they said we could make it into one. So I, I founded my first company on the day that I took my first faculty position. Um, I was also a single mom of two toddlers at the time. So I, I mean, I look back, I want to read those papers that I wrote during that era. They have to be hilarious. But um, so from there, that kind of got me, you know, interwoven into the Silicon Valley entrepreneur scene. And I kind of got lucky and caught another wave, which is I think what we're now calling med tech or health tech. Um, so in distinct from biotech, which is where, you know, scientists and technology kind of get together to make new drugs in new ways. Um, we, health tech is more focused on keeping people healthy or improving consumer healthcare experience, um, right? The, obviously, our healthcare system was not designed and optimized to delight the healthcare consumer. Um, and so, that, but there's ways that we can start to take the entrepreneurial, the, the tech mentality, um, this kind of consumer centric design theory and start pulling off very specific problems in healthcare that are just pretty much impossible to fix from within the system, but can be brought just slightly outside the system and dramatically improve the experience um, and uptake and adherence and compliance um, in a regulatorily compliant and responsible way. And that's where I think young healthcare providers have a really unique opportunity because I actually, you know, I could be totally wrong, but I actually think that this, the, the health tech or med tech or whatever we're calling it is really going to expand, you know, over the course of the next 10 years or so. And what it needs is, you know, bright, well-trained, you know, medical professionals who really understand the inner workings of our incumbent healthcare system and what things can be safely, you know, pulled outside and solved and connected back in and what things, you know, probably should be left alone. And so great opportunities. LinkedIn me if, if, you, if anybody's interested and wants to talk more about opportunities that could exist to do that. Um, so after I, I, uh, I stayed in academia for several years and then um, took a job at Complete Genomics, which I had one test in my lab. It was whole genome sequencing. Um, it was the right idea, just a few years too early for its time. Uh, and then I was on a founding executive team at Invite, which is kind of a, a next generation diagnostic testing laboratory. Then I did, I was lucky enough to do a tour of duty at 23andMe, which gave me, which people thought I was a little nuts taking that job, but it gave me this really great exposure to e-commerce thinking and consumer satisfaction and um, engagement and how do you get a, a a, a regular person to kind of engage in their health and ask survey, you know, answer surveys about their health, you know, it was a, and keep coming back to it. So there was just a, a ton that I learned from that experience. And all of that prepared me to um, land at Color Genomics. Um, I started there last fall. Um, and 
uh, Color is actually doing something that I've wanted to do for the last several years, which is um, kind of that consumer-centric design theory preventative genetics, because we really are getting to a point in time. My slides kind of stole this story. I suppose I should use them. Um, so we're, here's where we're, we're at you know, in our current healthcare strategy, right? We spend 75% of our, our dollars on you know, taking care of people who are already sick. Less than 3% is spent on preventing people from getting sick. And that's because our healthcare system's just not, our, the, the stakeholders in our healthcare system are, are generally not incentivized for prevention, right? The drug companies get paid money by selling drugs to sick people. The device companies get paid by selling devices to sick people. The, um, you know, even healthcare providers and, and hospitals, right? We, we make money by doing procedures on people and on um, facility fees. Um, and so nobody's really getting rewarded for, or properly for, for helping people stay, stay healthy. And so the people who are really incentivized to do that are the healthcare consumer, him or herself, um, and their self-insured employers, because that's a long-term relationship, right? Even the insurance companies, if you're in the fully insured population, there's such a high turnover on those plans that they don't want to invest um, in a preventative test for you because you're probably going to turn over in two years, and they're not going to have you. And that disease isn't going to hit you for five years or ten years. But a self-insured employer actually does want to keep you happy and productive for decades. So we've got an easy opportunity, a relatively low-hanging fruit, because we know from um, studies that have been done recently and guidelines that have been put out by professional societies recently that there are somewhere in the range of about 60 or 100 actionable genes where in the human genome where we actually know enough about them. If we see them in a healthy population, we've got evidence-based preventative guidelines to prevent you from getting sick in the first place. And that if we tested this whole room for those conditions, you know, somewhere about two or three percent of people harbor one of those kinds of preventable disorders, and very few people know it. So we've got a great preventative opportunity here. Um, and just to be clear, um, color focuses on not on um, multiplied odds ratio risk scores that you know barely increase your risk or whatever. We really are going for the hard hitting, preventable, well established hereditary cancer syndromes like. Um, BRCA1, BRCA2, or the uh, hereditary cardiomyopathies and arrhythmias. Those are the young athletes who tend to drop dead on the, on the basketball court um, and similar disorders. Um, so how do we change the stats that I showed you? Well, first I said you kind of got to get outside the system a little bit because the, the system itself has so many illogical band-aids stuck on top of it for like 50 or 60 years of politicians who don't understand that much about health care putting short-term Band-Aids on so that they can get reelected, um, and other illogical things that have happened over the last 50, 60 years that it's really hard to move and do the right thing and care about the healthcare consumer inside the system. So if you can get outside the system, which means generally one of those things is you need it to be cheap enough where a consumer can choose to pay for it or it is cost effective enough for a self-insured employer to invest in it. And we are at that point with um, inherited disease sequencing, next-gen sequencing. Um, and then, of course, you, you should wait, make sure that the medical professional guidelines are, are there, and those have come out over the last few years as well, from the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics, um, as well as the, the CDC um, has their tier one population health applications, um, and then uh, ClinGen, which is an organization uh, that is NIH funded, that is actually, um, it's kind of like a crowdsourcing of uh, curation of the clinical genome. And then you add some Silicon Valley pixie dust to it. And so here we are, we've got, we are check step one. Smartphone um, penetrance is also important too. This is, a, this is a great way for us to actually reach and engage people in health and wellness in ways that we haven't before. Um, we've got, like I said, the, the medical professional societies have come along and given out guidelines. And then in 2015, Color, uh, launched its first flagship test, which is a hereditary cancer uh, preventative test, looking at things like uh, hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, Lynch syndrome, and similar types of disorders. And the things, we, we make this available. It's always a physician-ordered test. It comes with free genetic counseling or unlimited genetic counseling. So we really wanted to do it right, 
and we wanted to be responsible and obviously regulatorily compliant, but we kind of just broke everything down to first principles to see where we could make it more accessible because the current way of getting genetic testing is actually has so much friction in it that even people at high risk oftentimes don't go through with the testing, let alone people who could benefit from prevent preventative testing. Um, so instead of um, taking a day off work, going and talking to your genetic counselor for an hour, maybe they'll order the test for you, maybe they won't. If they do, you go get in another queue, you wait, you get your blood draw, a few weeks later you come back and you go through the same thing again, having to take another day off work. Um, well now, in 2015, 2016, 2017, we can actually do a lot of those steps a lot more efficiently. Um, and so for uh, $249, it's affordable to not everybody, but to a lot of people. And we've got programs to, to access, to make it accessible to people who can't afford tests, but, but need it and their insurance won't pay for it. Um, but for the, the average person who just wants to know about their preventative health and wellness, um, you order it online, you can use your own physician, uh, or we've got a third party, independent third party network of physicians who will review your health intake information and order the test for you if they feel it's appropriate. Um, we'll send you a spit kit in the mail. Uh, we do the testing, you receive the results online, it goes to your doctor as well online. Um, the uh, appropriate um, actionability guidelines are attached so that your doctor, who probably doesn't understand genetics very well either, um, has a really quick one click to, um, to evidence-based practice guidelines for what the preventative options are. Um, every result is, um, a positive result is given out with genetic counseling session, but anybody can get genetic counseling from our genetic counselors, and that's done uh, by, the tel on, by the telephone. And then importantly, this is also something our incumbent healthcare system just can't fix because of how it's structured, is the family testing, because genetic diseases are family diseases. And so what we do is we empower the pro band to be the champion for their family. And then there's a whole bunch of HIPAA rules that come into place if you're inside the hospital at that point. But what, what we did is we just built a tool where with one click and just entering in the addresses of his or her at-risk family members, he or she sends the address from his account, but it sucks in all of the relevant information that the at-risk family member would need to make a decision about whether or not they wanted to get testing and access to our genetic counselors. And then to further remove barriers in these very high-risk people, because they're 50% chance of having that same variant, we do it for $50. Um, and then we continue to remind people to get their regular screenings, even if they're you know, negative for the hereditary cancer syndromes, um, as well as their high risk guidelines if uh, they're at high risk. And so that's, that's what I'm doing today, and I'm, I've got one of the funnest jobs in the country. And an adorable child. My kids were never that well behaved. That's, that, that's wonderful. So, why don't we go next to Jess Mega. Jess uh, gave me the ultimate compliment. Uh, she, and this is my way of introducing her, she, was a, she is a protege of a uh, cardiologist that uh, Gene Bromwald, who many of us, uh, have looked up for years. For those of you who are not doctors, he wrote the textbook. And apparently, unless she's much better at flattery than I even uh, estimated, she said that prior to leaving for uh, Verily, uh, Jean said that I was one of the people that she should talk to. So I've actually never met her before, but instantly when I saw her, I took a instant liking to her, recognized her as a, a kindred soul, and I'm very happy to uh, hear from, uh, from Jess what she views as the uh, imperatives and concerns around the consumer report play in precision medicine. Thank you. Uh, so that is indeed a true story. Uh, so it is an absolute honor to be here. And before I, I tell my story, and, and that's what we were asked to do, I really wanted to thank all the presenters this morning and particularly thank Shirley, uh, the story we heard will stay with me for the rest of my life. And so from the very bottom of my heart, thank you so much. So we were asked today to, to tell a little bit about uh, our story and, and hopefully continue this, this dialogue. So I uh, have two parents who are physicians and what I used to do on the weekends is round in the hospital. 
And what it taught me is, uh, why wouldn't you want to do this job with all these, these free uh, peanut butter and graham crackers? I mean, this is a phenomenal job. Uh, but that aside, uh, what I did learn from my parents, so my mom's a child psychiatrist and my dad's an ENT surgeon, and, and what I saw uh, was two people who cared very deeply for their patients. And what I realized is if they could find joy in this very diverse profession, uh, then, then there's, there's got to be a place for me there as well. Now, the one thing I did do is I ended up going into internal medicine and cardiology. And uh, for those of you in that field, the nice thing is it actually really united my parents because they really like to make fun of internists. Uh, any, any other internists out there? Yeah, excellent. I, I think we're great. Um, but what they like to do is, is talk about how detail-oriented uh, internists are. So I was really glad to continue to bring my parents further, uh, closer together. So I, I did grow up as a cardiologist. I did my training uh, predominantly in town, so it's very fun to be back home. Some of my best friends and colleagues are here. And there were two things that I did with my job here. One is critical care cardiology. And, and one thing that we'll be talking about today is next generation technology. And I truly do believe that we'll never ultimately replace what it means to hold someone's hand uh, during life and, and during death. And that is something many of us have had the honor to be able to see. Uh, the other thing I was able to do is, is get involved in research. And I started with the clinical trials world about 15 years ago in cardiovascular medicine. And, Interestingly, even though that doesn't seem like that long ago, I am still shocked by the reduction in mortality. And, and even though this morning, and, and again, we were reminded, um, Shirley reminded us, when we look at trials overall, we're only seeing the aggregate. With that being said, we still have been continuing to chip away at, at many important diseases. But the realization being on the side of, of, of the clinical trials world is when we report out an aggregate result, so we might record out a 20% relative risk reduction in something like cardiovascular death and myer stroke, that doesn't tell us what, what it means for Zach or for Jill or for me. And we became interested in starting to look at blood samples. And a colleague of mine, Mark Sabatin, uh, we got together and started to think about ways to make more use of the clinical trials data. And what we were thinking about was early genetics work and what this led to was a group of us, and as they say, it takes a village. It truly, in this space, takes a village. And we started to collect samples and over time got quite interested in a particular medicine, clopidogrel or Plavix. It's one of the most commonly used medications worldwide for patients with heart attack. Yet what we started to see is that even in trials, the overall aggregate results are quite favorable, but there are groups of patients who don't respond. So if you're on this side of the room, you may be a responder, an optimal responder, and there's subsets of patients that don't respond. And so by doing some work, and, and this work takes time, I think that was one thing that, that we heard this morning, but over time we were able to look at certain genetic variants uh, that did indeed impact the response to Plavix. Interestingly, there's a long road between scientific discovery and clinical application, and I think we'll talk more about that in the panel. Um, but it was a really an amazing, amazing journey. And so where I found myself was uh, doing early work in genetics and genomics, dealing with a lot of clinical data. And I, I got a call one day, and I got a call uh, from California, from Google. And uh, how many people here were in Boston around, it was the winter of 2014, 2015? All right, what were we doing that winter? We were shoveling. We were shoveling. Um, it made for good business for a cardiologist. No, just kidding. Um, uh, that was a bad joke, a really bad joke. Um, uh, I, I actually had my child uh, who started to shovel as well. So we were doing a lot, a lot of shoveling. And uh, so I got a call from California, and uh, I told them I'm a very happy, uh, happy cardiologist. Uh, I, I think academics affords a lot of freedom, uh, but. Uh, it was, again, that winter of 2014-15, so I did hop on a plane and went to visit. And what I found, uh, I, I went to go visit Google, and what I found was a group within Google X focusing on next-generation technologies to apply to healthcare. And it was a relatively small group, but I really was blown away by the commitment to this kind of work. And so uh, I took a leave of absence from here and uh, found myself out in, in California. And, Interestingly, the group I joined was called Google X, and Google X is part of the research and development arm of Google, and 
uh, I, I saw that we had the driverless car group and we had an access and energy group. And initially you might wonder, what's a cardiologist doing sitting next to someone working on a car? I mean, I do drive a car, but uh, that's, about, that's about my limit of, of knowledge. But what you realize very quickly is if you're trying to figure out how to have an autonomous vehicle, you need to understand all of the maps. The car needs to know where it is in time and space and the road changes. So much like the human health system that you have to understand, and then you have to understand the individual in that context, um, you start to realize that there's some synergies. And so being part of a company, and Google's mission is to organize the world's information, well, that can be done in many different ways. And so our group within healthcare grew quite quickly, and we became our own, our own unit, and so we're now called Verily. And we focus on three main things. If you were to really ask me to boil it down, what do we do? We create tools to collect information, and we spent a lot of time today talking about molecular information. I want to make sure we also keep our brains entirely open to the idea that right now, the amount of digital exhaust coming off us is massive. So we have my heart rate, my blood pressure, what is my posture like, what is my tone like, how am I using words? This idea of precision medicine, I think the molecular area is incredibly fascinating. We uh, have a number of pro programs there, but also thinking really broadly of what precision means. What about my choices? And, and we heard about that this morning. So we're creating some tools that look at known signals, but then there's also this idea of unknown signals. And so we have launched a program called the Baseline Study, and uh, it's something I'd be happy to talk more about. But I think we have to keep pushing the limit of what does precision mean. So the first thing is collecting information. The second thing is tapping into tools to organize the information, whether this is distributed computing, uh, and then layering on machine learning in the appropriate way. Um, sometimes that's appropriate, sometimes that's not. And then the final piece is activating the information. If we don't do that well, then we'll fall short. So I'm, we're thinking about activating information in three different ways. One is with patients. So we're thinking about programs, for example, to bring tools to people with diabetes. Uh, we're thinking about providers. So we have a program working on neural net enhanced digital retinopathy images to help read those images. Uh, that's something that we hope will increase the number of patients getting screened for digital or for diabetic retinopathy. And then finally, what about systems? And so one example there is a surgical robotics program. In each of these cases, it's new tools to collect, organize, and activate that information. So it, it's been quite a, a journey. It's a really fun to be back. And I'll conclude by saying that there is a world out there of, of new tools, but we have been using new technologies for years. And so as a cardiologist, uh, I've been using the stethoscope uh, during my career. The first stethoscope is over 200 years old. People talked about that as a new technology at the time. We've been using cardiac imaging. That's a technology. We now have a next generation of technology. But it is out there, it's going to be available, but we have to take all of the people in the room, whether you're someone who is part of a patient advocacy group, if you're a patient yourself, if you're a healthcare provider, but what I would argue is that we really need to lean in because this, 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 this plane is taken off and we have a role to have a seat at the table and it's been a real privilege to be there. So thank you for the invitation. And last but not least, uh, someone who really has, I think, come closest perhaps to uh, creating a framework uh, for taking precision medicine data and sharing it and standardizing it is uh, someone who I've never met and I've spoken to and I just realized I don't know how to pronounce his last name, so forgive me, Taha. Uh, Taha Kashout, who is... Uh, the former uh, Chief Health Informatics Officer at the uh, Food and Drug Administration and now CEO of his own consulting firm. Taha, where are you? There, great. So, looking forward to, to finally shaking your hand. Very in nice the, to meet you. In the flesh, and looking forward to hearing from you. Thank you so much. Thanks. Well, thank you for having me today. It's really been inspiring all day, so, um, um, uh, just I thought maybe I can sh share a couple of highlights from my time at FDA and try to tie it to precision, uh, precision medicine. So um, imagine that you, you're the world leading uh, consumer safety uh, organization, yet your consumers cannot, uh, cannot access your products. So when I joined the FDA in 2013, March 2013, as its first chief health informatics officer, 
and uh, left about a year ago and still they haven't hired the next one. It might have been the last chief health and practice officer, we don't know. <laughs> but um, here we are in, in a, not just in a big d data era, but also consumer empowerment era, yet you can't, uh, consumers and clinicians can't access the data, the wealth of information that FDA has around medical products, food, cosmetics, tobacco. 20% um, of the data was generated by consumers directly to FDA. 60% uh, of that uh, in post-market surveillance was initiated by consumers, yet you couldn't access that information. Uh, even if you went to Google to Google a drug name, for example, I mean, the, all the way down in the fi fine print, the, the address events came from Wikipedia or Daily Med, uh, Daily Med from NIH that was shut down during the government shutdown for 38 days. So it's Daily Med that was shut down. So, so you can imagine the, the complexity of this. So, um, so I took that upon myself to well, how can we kind of cha change this? This is an era of where you, if you want to design an app right now, you can just um, uh, you know uh, call the Twitter API or Facebook API or Google API and start start you know start coding and, and develop products that are consumer consumer facing and halfway through the discussion with some of the leadership at the FDA realized an API application program and interface they were hearing uh, um, uh, active pharmaceutical ingredients so there was a quite a bit of uh, education that I had to do on my own to kind of kind of really bring bring pe people to bear but if you really listen hard at the FDA they were really willing to change I mean this is yes the data was buried beyond bureaucracies in a, in a century old um, uh, culture. But there was really this, 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 this passion about how can we connect with consumers? What is the right way to connect with consumers? So, so one way we did, which was really, I launched the, the uh, conceptualized and launched the Open FDA initiative. Um, and two weeks after that, the government shut down for four <laughs> weeks. And so, we, so you can imagine how, you know, the complexity about all those. But uh, within seven months, we launched the very first API, and that was around the adverse events of drugs. And it was really amazing because the night before we launched, uh, FDA almost pulled the plug on that, realizing oh my gosh, what's gonna happen if people start misinterpreting this information? So they were really worried about the reproducibility of misinterpretation. Uh, and this is really where for almost a year now, I've been at the FDA really working hard about this whole concept about, you know, it's m not just about just dumping data out there, not just about, you know, putting the, the source code out there, which we did, the, it was the very first GitHub and open source, but also really working with the ecosystem, try to uh, grow that ecosystem around this. Misinterpretation did happen, did happen many times, but it was really amazing to see the self-correcting community coming back and, 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 and chiming in uh, uh, and, 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 and finding ways about keeping the work, the, the great work, uh, uh, happening. Uh, a year later, the White House uh, strategy for uh, American innovation uh, referenced Open FDA as one of the leading innovations in the United States uh, in the same sentence as autonomous vehicles and smart cities. Uh, so you can imagine the impact it had on the community for us, or for me at least, when we started this. It's like, you know, fences make good neighbors. Let's make, to target consumers, let's work with researchers to advance the regulatory science. Let's also work with software developers who know how to reach consumers, build a really sustainable and scalable uh, uh, um, uh, framework for, for them to do this, and enrich the data. It wasn't just we just dumped data out there. It was harmonized data. You get not only for the first time you can search um, adverse events by every field in the label, you get the recall. So you get the the, uh, the labeling information. You might get ad additional things if you have, uh, uh, you know, you're looking at medical devices or looking at food or tobacco or whatnot. So. Um so that was really the, the, the amazing th uh, thing that happened. What was really even more amazing was just like how this setup now is uh, uh, changed the culture at FDA to really be more open about what more can we do with this kind of setup. Now that we have seen about how the data, the science, the community all coming together. And it was around the same time that the, the, the glitch that happened with 23andMe and all the negative press that FDA has had about FDA is killing innovation. It was just major headlines everywhere you went. Just FDA is after innovators. FDA after small companies. FDA, you know, it's very, very um, uh, complex regulatory process, whatnot. And and you inside the FDA, really, it was it was it was challenging because you know it's not true. We know that we're trying to do our best to kind of change this this mantra. And that was really where um, I was a co-lead of the Precision Medicine Initiative at the FDA, part of uh, President Obama's Precision Medicine uh, that was announced a few months later during the State of uh, Union address. Uh, and then I took that the same approach to launch Precision FDA. And that was really the, the idea about um, how can you generate new evidence around analytic validity 
uh, which doesn't exist, uh, did not exist at the time. You can have order your uh, test kit right now for any of those companies and, and, and run the test from another test company, you might get different results. Even the same lab, you can, you know, you can get different results. The benchmark uh, for certain things, we really know the benchmark, but 20% of the, the genome, the variants in genome, were, were still unknown. We're still, uh, uh, you know, uncharted ter territory. Uh, different methods, the, the underlying technology of the short reads, it has a lot of flaws in it as well. So how can you create a new evidence for, for analytic validity? And that was really the whole notion about precision FDA, but it was a lot simpler for me or easier for me to sell that idea in the agency, even though it took me about seven months uh, to socialize that idea. And I, I remember Rob Califf telling me like, you must be spoken pot if that's really what you want to do. <laughs> and, and later on, what, what was quoted in Stat News, <laughs> Uh, you know, but, but the, because he said, like, nobody, nobody wants to share data. Why would the company share data with academia? Why would the academia share data with pharmaceutical company and whatnot? I mean, it's, just, it's impossible. But that turned out not to be true because uh, when you change the incentive about, wouldn't you want your test kit to be of the highest quality in the marketplace? How about we create a fun place for you to share what you're com comfortable sharing? We start issuing challenges. For example, you know, show us, we, uh, we give you the, the test, we also give you the, the, the answers and show us where you're able to get the same answers. Sometimes we had the answers, we'll be able to show that your methods sort of far exceeded others. But along the way, not only that the usual suspects were participating, like the Broad Institute and, and, and Pfizer and whatnot, but it was like two people in a garage in San Francisco that really like have perfected a new method for uh, variant calling using machine learning that suddenly start, start showing that our method is just like, you know, it's doing just as good as, as, as what's, what's out there and sometimes it's even better. And the FDA start looking at this, well, can we also use this now down the road as a regulatory tool beyond just regulatory science and R&D? And the whole idea about you know, the, the, ac the, the accuracy and reproducibility, basically, you know, can your test call the right variants? Can the test call the right variants every, every single time? So, um, so we launched Precision FDA about a year and a half now. There's over 3,000 organizations and entrepreneurs on the platform, about six challenges being issued, tons of apps, over 600 uh, pipelines being populated um, on, on Precision FDA. A new reference material were, were published by Nest uh, on this platform. Just to show you the power of, of, of really amazing ecosystem, uh, you know, with the right intent can do together. And this is where, like, you know, uh, and it was really amazing to see for almost a year after the 23andMe sort of story, all the negative press about FDA suddenly when we launched Open, uh, Precision FDA, how it all just changed to be positive, and it was really in the spirit that FDA really is, you know, is, is on our side. By the time I left FDA, we had been going on with Precision FDA for almost six months. Uh, I counted about a dozen new companies trying to bring new to genetic products to the marketplace who say, we put our data on Precision FDA. We understand it's a research, research and development platform, but would you consider it? Would you consider this information part of my submission? And that was really where start, Precision FDA started moving because on a request of the community, I almost think about it as a Wikipedia you know, approach. If you have a really good, solid Wikipedia page, a lot of people will reference it. A lot of people will have a lot of confidence in it. And this is really the, the essence about how we moved from a top-down regulation to where FDA is really looking at uh, for each intent uh, of, of these genome uh, sequ sequence platforms and, and tools or kits about how we can evaluate the entire body of evidence that has been generated by scientists, researchers, entrepreneurs, companies, in the world and put it all in one place so everybody can, can, uh, can see this. Um, uh, so, so that's really where, I mean, the, the story I was trying to tell you about, I mean, my background, just really quickly, so, so I'm, I'm really driven, passionate about building that uh, rich and sustainable ecosystems that empower consumers. My background, I'm a cardiologist by training, was trained actually behind this wall in Beth Israel and a statistician. Um, uh, my undergrad actually was architecture. I come from a family where my dad is an architect, my mom is a, is a physician. But well, we have a five physicians. My two brothers are stroke interventionists. My sister is a dentist in the Bay Area, and, and it wasn't good enough for my mom to stay as an architect. Actually, without her, I wouldn't be here today talking about precision medicine, probably be talking about you know, designing a building, maybe for precision medicine, but let's see. Well, thank you so much for having me. As an architect, you might have had a job in this administration. No. Uh, anyway. Uh, could everybody, could please, uh, the panel join me um, at the table here? So while the audience uh, warms itself up to think about the um, 
questions it wants to ask, and I'm only going to give them about seven minutes. I'm going to ask my question. Consider the following two facts. A, uh, in 2003, um, a, a survey was done of, cans of primary care providers, primary care providers, and they were asked in 2003, have you ordered a cancer genomic genetic test for asymptomatic patients in the prior year? And an astonishing 30 percent of them in 2003 said we have. By the way, when I ask random audiences, they, they guess maybe 1 percent, 30 percent. And then when, they, when you ask them, when you look in the same study, what was the trigger for this uh, ordering of test? It's not their age, not where they trained, not that they obtained a family history. No. Nope. It's that the, and this is, I'm not being a shill here, it's that they Googled their family history of breast cancer, learn about BRCA1, BRCA2, and go to the doctor and ask for the test. And the doc doctor then just orders a test. Other studies show that doctors are very uncomfortable and not very competent, primary care doctors, interpreting the test. Hold that. If you look at claims data, as I have, across 50 million Americans, and you look at bracket testing, there's this big peak jump up in bracket testing. I think most of you know where that big jump up came from. <laughs> Carrie, what, what's it from? Angelina. You bet. So right after that, as you keep on going, there's actually not an increase in unilateral mastectomy. And people have noted that. But when our buddy Raj Monrai looked further, there was a big bump in bilateral mastectomy. So the question I have for the, for the uh, panel is this. In a era where doctors are not particularly comfortable, nor particularly competent in dealing with molecular characterizations, specifically genomic testing, and patients are being driven to it, and as often happens, if they've read more about it, may be more knowledgeable than doctors at times. Where are the drivers, opportunities, or perhaps um, potholes in going forward to creating a consumer reports kind of framework around quality? So we don't have the usual authorities being authoritative, and we have the unusual, the consumers, potentially being more authoritative, but it's not their job, and they're certainly not framing it. So I think we're going to get a lot of different, I think we're going to get different uh, perspectives of this. And I'll start in the middle. Gary, what do you think? Yeah, it's, um, I mean, I think you've hit right in the heart of the issue here. In that Institute of Medicine report I mentioned, we actually called out a consumer reports uh, for genomic testing as a reasonable avenue to develop. Again, getting stakeholders together, particularly patients, but providers, payers, everyone agreeing on what is the evidence, what is the level of evidence that's needed to move this uh, into routine care, um, how are we going to co compile and monitor this data over time. It's both safety and efficacy. There's a false positive, false negative uh, side to this story, like there's any testing. Um, and, but in the end, again, a, 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 as a report, we had no authority. We couldn't in, insist that the FDA uh, put this into effect, or the NIH, or CMS uh, 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 do this. Uh, but what we really insisted on, I know there's been discussions about getting the major federal agencies, and both uh, federal and as well as uh, commercial developers and payers and patient advocacy groups together uh, to, to, to come to consensus and on a process and, and, and how to do this. In the end, it has to be something that patients can access. It's understandable uh, that they can look at, download, print out, take into their doctor, and discuss with them. Um, and I, I think, uh, you know, maybe 
consumer reports is a little simplistic when we're talking about healthcare delivery around genomic testing, but I think it can be done in a way that is manageable and can be brought to the point of, of the shared decision making, the discussion with the clinician, uh, uh, with a full engagement, again, of the various uh, federal and commercial uh, agencies involved here. So I think the whole concept is, is one that makes a great deal of sense. I think physicians, uh, I can't speak for all, but I think most would engage because, as I said earlier, most of us are not trained in this field. Uh, we're overwhelmed with the, not only what's already there, but how rapid the, the pace is. Uh, and having guidance of that sort and have the patient fully involved in it is just critical. I don't see any way forward other than doing it in this type of fr uh, framework. So I'll just editorialize to say I still think that even today, I get a lot more out of consumer reports about different features of the cars I might buy than about these gene panel tests. Oh, absolutely. That, so I don't want to, be, we be, should be so lucky that we have as much data as consumer reports. So Jill, you've been in several companies. Uh, in fact, I lost count, but I think it was three, mm -hmm. or was it four? Three? The genomics. Uh, genomics companies, complete yeah. genomics. Uh, in Vitae, 23 me and color. Yeah, four, four, four. four, four. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so they all must have had a different approach, but how did you deal with the fact that there's these different stakeholders? Who, where was the quality control going to come from in that instance? Uh, so quality control, I mean, to me, that's just got to be a given. The, the, you know, and as a pathologist, a clinical pathologist, like that's just our bread and butter. That's what we train for decades to do is put together a safe, reliable, robust test that does what it says it does and means what we say it means. And um, so t to me, that's just a, a sine qua non. Um, it is, um, I think, in, in some ambitious, well-intended startups, it, there's a learning cycle for folks that don't have that background as, as a training. But that's an opportunity, again, for healthcare providers to partner up with these, these startup companies and help them go through those learning cycles more quickly. Um, and so the, you know, I, I feel like we've got um, regulatory in environment, as long as you've got the knowledgeable people, you know, at the table uh, with the right credentials, right, you're going to put out a responsible test as far as analytical validity and clinical validity goes. Um, the consumer part of that, and understand it, because all tests are different, and all tests have some limitations to them, um, and it's hard even to talk to doctors about what we do when we're really in the weeds in genomics. Um, we can essentially only talk to each other. It's like a special twin language. Um, but the, what I've learned at these companies, um, particularly 23andMe and Color, where most of my executive teammates, in, in fact, most of the company, comes from places like Google and Twitter and Netflix and StubHub and Gilt, right? Um, which are really, there's a complete art and science to engaging a consumer, engaging that consumer to, to communicate or to buy a pair of shoes or to click on a button. I mean, you maybe, you know, the, the we AV test, like, do I get a higher comprehension of this concept if I make the text, you know, dark blue versus purple, right? And you AV test that to death. I mean, it's, it really got, does go down to an art and science. And I think, it, although it's not yet consumer reports, it's this kind of marriage of, of the art and science of medicine and the art and science of consumer engagement where we really have got an opportunity to, to improve the health of, of our country and our, of our healthcare consumers. So I, I think we're getting there. So Jess, you talked about three lines of business, one of which was sort of the consumer uh, patient facing one, another was provi uh, providers facing one. So in the context of where you see the educational deficit and or concern about quality, where do you think, Verily, in your own work, you can be most impactful? Yeah, I, I think there are two issues. One, when it comes to patient-facing materials, how do we actually bring value? Uh, and I think Jill did such a nice job of really talking about a patient who is engaged, who wants to learn more, but we have to be clear. The other thing, and you and I were talking during the break about the change in medical education, 
there is so much information coming in and how do we provide the right decision support tools but let physicians ultimately still be responsible for that information and when it pertains particularly to genetics there's some cases where it's going to be quite deterministic i think one big challenge is we're used to studying a uh, very classic mendelian genetics and sometimes a variant may just be more probabilistic in the same way that a patient comes in with renal disease or diabetes, and I integrate that when I think about the risk of heart disease, we may be integrating this information in, in the context of a much larger picture. It's not gonna tell us, in all cases, the whole story. And Taha, you're the one who's tried to work the most to make this kind of consumer report happen, so where do you think it's gonna happen? Well, I think it's gonna happen at the intersection of all these um, sort of entities combined. I mean, I, when I was at the FDA, I mean, we held so many public workshops where we invited patients and physicians together on the same, uh, in the same panels and discuss, you know, what are the, some of the issues and understood the point of views of each. I mean, in this space, we have to also understand, I mean, false positive rate is pretty high for some of these really disease, I mean, for these diseases. It's one thing to get, like, you hate the, 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 the taste of cilantro sort of variant versus, you know, an ovarian cancer, or we have a false positive for that. I mean, so there's a quite a bit of clinical uh, implication, and without the right clinical evidence behind it, it's, it's really hard. Uh, to move on, but I think the consensus was let's work together on building that evidence so we can achieve that. And, and FDA wanted to start initially with the analytic validity, get the, the, the noise out, uh, and then over time achieve uh, the clinical validity. I mean, if, if, you, if you're on Netflix and get the reviews, why not? It's a lot easier because you have a lot, da a lot more data to base that on where he, here's, a, here's viewers like you, so to speak. In, in, in this area, it's a lot harder when we have the, the data still fragmented. It, it ex exists in different places. You don't have all the information about me at that particular time. Also, the uniqueness. I mean, 30% uh, of uh, hypertensive patients are unique, not similar. Uh, so we need to understand that there's uniqueness in even treatment pathways that we have to better tailor uh, this. But it's going to come with time, but it really has to be public, private, consumers in the center. But consumer uh, provider interaction should always be on the center as well. Great. So in the spirit of um, diversity, I'm going to try to get as many people who have not asked questions, asking questions as possible. So John, please sit down. <laughs> <laughs> it's rough. I tell you, when I, was on, when I was a senior resident, we had very, very short rounds, and we got to breakfast earlier before any other team. Uh, <clears throat> while there might not be a consumer reports, there is clinical trials that got and more specific to precision medicine, there's ClinVar, right? And so what role can things like clinical trials that got and more specific to precision medicine, ClinVar play in that kind of here is how you present the information to the patient so that they know that they're not being sold snake oil? Yeah, the ClinVar and ClinGen are incredible, much needed resources that are, you know, you know, they're in their early days and they're still, you know, coming into their own but they will be really valuable resources. Right now, they feel to me like they're a great resource for me and my colleagues, and they're kind of, it, it doesn't look or feel consumer friendly, um, but there's a great startup idea. There we go, yes, go ahead. Uh, my question is for Jill. Um, so tr traditionally, we diagnose the cancer by the pathologist based on the tissue specimen, by looking at it visually, look at it through the microscope. So in the future, if uh, we diagnose the cancer through the gene genome sequencing, so um, what do you think about the role of pathologists, or we do we have to change the clinical practice, or do we have to retire or get more fellowship? Great is, question. Yes, this question is about the death of the pathologist. Exactly. <laughs> so this question has been posed to me since the mid-90s. Um, and it, it, my job, I embrace technology. And I, it, what it did is it kind of took out all the mundane aspects of my job and let me concentrate on the more challenging cases and, and, and interesting ideas. So I, I really don't think in any practical way that it, the, the pathologist can or will go away. The pathologist, the role of the pathologist will, is and will continue to change. Um, but you still need to assess margins, right? You can't just take a chunk of, 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 of tumor and, and, and look at it and give a molecular characterization and be done with the case, right? There's a lot of other aspects and a lot of other work that pathologists do to put together a surgical pathology report. I, and, I don't know, maybe someday we'll get robots to do it, right? It could happen. But I, I have no doubt that the role of the surgical pathologist will continue to, to evolve, and as well as the, the clinical pathologist. So I don't think so. But I don't 
know if anybody else thinks we're going away. Actually, I think, I think you're one of the ones who's going to lead to the death of the pathologist, and you're among the causative, in, in the best possible way, the causative uh, agent of it. And some people in deep learning would actually disagree with you about the margins uh, question. <laughs> but in any case, yes, go ahead. Hi, Lisa Bedford. I'm from Takeda Pharmaceuticals. I'm also in a Master's of Epidemiology program at BU. Um, so my question, we, we have a lot of MDs here, which would make sense, we're at Harvard Medical School. But when I go to my doctor's office, I see a physician assistant, I see a nurse. Um, in my practice in gen genetics, I've seen a lot of um, genetic epidemiologists or genetic counselors. So I was wondering if you could speak more to the roles of these new figures and how they fit in. I think we've talked about molecular tumor boards, but not really what they're made up of and, and how these new entities are gonna play a role as you bring the technology as well as you know, the breakdown of kind of the field of medicine into all of these niche groups. So I think everybody here in the panel has something that they could say to it, so I'll ask all of you to just answer, but briefly. Jill. Oh, okay, I'll start. I'll take genetic counseling. Um, obviously, the current system doesn't scale, mm -hmm. um, but I think the, the genetic counselors themselves have realized that it doesn't scale, and they're actually really engaging and being part of, of these solutions of, you know, what parts of genetic counseling can uh, can we take back down to first principles and, and, and break it apart and squeeze out the, the dead space and, and get the quick answers quickly and efficiently to the people who have quick questions and leave our big hour-long counseling sessions for uh, you know, the folks who actually really need that long of a counseling session. So I like pathologists, I, I think all of these healthcare providers are con going to continue to evolve. And I also think it's important for the you know, to keep the, la you know, to have this more consumer friendly language and, and experience, not just for the doctors, but also for the nurses and physician assistants. Taha? Uh -huh. I would just add something like, you know, it needs to be education uh, at the healthcare system level, the importance of precision medicine. Because right now they really don't see the incentive or they see the true value in that uh, outside the, the usual suspects. I, clearly, the, uh, these uh, genetic counselors and others involved in this space are critical to the training of physicians uh, coming through and, and uh, postgraduate physicians. Uh, my own experience with molecular tumor boards is uh, uh, both nationally and locally, it's very spotty in terms of the stakeholders involved there. And I think it, again, is critical not to just have clinicians and maybe the molecular pathologists at the table making the decisions. Uh, but um, uh, all, all of these individuals uh, should be um, either available or active participants in, in these um, multidisciplinary discussions uh, given the complexity uh, and, and rapid changes taking place. And I'll answer in a slightly orthogonal way. One is the connecting physicians to one another so that we're not learning just from the cases in front of us but from the community of cases, whether it's uh, primary care or surgery. The other thing is this idea of how do you bridge people from this episodic care paradigm? So you see someone in clinic, you give them a ton of information as a physician. Um, the idea that there's a more continuous network out there of care providers and care extenders, it's something that's used in a lot of countries and it's probably something that we should be thinking more seriously about. Great, and I apologize again to, as usual, to the additional questions, so we'll just take one more question, because then we have to briefly break before the next talk. Full disclosure, I asked a question this morning. Do I need to defer? <laughs> You'll get special dispensation. Thank you. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be quick. So this year we saw revisions passed to the common rule protecting human research uh, participants, and one of those changes is that now in consent forms, um, People are, uh, need to be informed if their tissue is being collected for research purposes, if they've agreed to, to, uh, to allow that, that their tissue could be de-identified and then used for purposes, because once it's de-identified, it's not considered human subject material. It can be used for any purpose whatsoever beyond whatever permission they have authorized their tissue to be used for. Um, so this approach strikes me as, as, as somewhat um, punitive and harsh in the sense that we're, we're telling people, we're taking your tissue, it could be de-identified, we don't know what it'll be used for in the future, do you really want to do this with us? It seems like a very negative and hostile interaction, and I wonder if you have thoughts about how a, a more humanizing and um, constructive approach to uh, asking people to donate their tissue might um, proceed. 
Okay, Jill, that's, this should be up your alley. Yeah, so I, I didn't want to hog the micro microphone, but the whole time I was thinking, oh, I got, I, I got something for that. So, um, you know, without speaking, you know, specifically about any changes to, to any guidelines or laws or regulations, um, what, what I, I've learned and, and what I think other people are starting to publish on now is, is that people want to share, people want to help, right? They want to participate. Um, and especially when somebody's, they're sick or somebody in their family's sick, they're really activated at that moment and they want to share. And that we um, kind of as researchers, um, it, with the best of intentions, probably have overprotected the, the research participant to a place where we're no longer representing what they need or want and kind of getting in our own way of doing meaningful research with them. Um, I think. Uh, you know, I've got to applaud companies like 23andMe, who's really kind of gotten that whole research paradigm outside the system and empowered the research participant. They get over 90% of, of their um, customers choose to participate in research and stay actively engaged and coming back and answering more questions and um, consenting to research and, and responding really positively to when um, something that they participated gets it turned into a publication. Like, it's... People want to do this, and we need to, I agree, we need to make this a more human, human experience, because um, people want it. Now, I would just add again our experience, and it may vary with disease setting and, and severity and so forth. In, the, in a severe situation like metastatic breast cancer, is the patients are eager to have their data shared and used for discovery and, and bettering the next generation of patients in that situation. Um, they, they feel this is uh, much of the reason they participated in the study is to uh, ha advance the field and, and confidentiality and concerns over that are, are way at the bottom of the priorities. Any other comments? No, no. In that case, thank the panel.